Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are um, going to continue on in 1 Corinthians. We're going to talk about something that, um, to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure why Paul went down that road. I understand why he did. But I, to me, it's, it's like you're never going to get yourself a good ending when you start telling women how to dress. You guys know that? Um, <laughs> Uh, when you walk out of the bedroom and your wife looks at you and she goes, are you planning on wearing that? The answer is not yes. Okay, the answer means go back in there and try again is what that means. Um, my first, second church I was in, uh, a couple weeks after I started, we had these what's called praise prompt singers. I know some churches have that. They get a couple of people up there and they help you sing the song. Basically, um, they sing it for you and, and it, it, it does a good job. But these two... College A's girls were, were singing up there, and, and one of them had her belly button shown, okay, which I don't, I don't care. If you want to, you know, do that. It wasn't that big of a deal to me, but one of my board members comes marching up to me, and she goes, I am going to talk to her about that. And I went, no, you're not. <laughs> and uh, I said, if you talk to her about that, number one, you will never see her in church again, and the family either. I said, let me take care of this. Um, so... And he had a point, but it's like, if you're going to die on a hill, I wasn't quite sure that was worth dying on. But because he was out of control, I had to do something. So Lori and I took the two girls out for pizza. Pizza always fixes everything. You guys know that? And I explained to him the situation on how some people think. Okay. Now, some people don't think. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but here's the issue. And probably in dealing with my two daughters, probably the number one thing, I, I especially with Brianna, I'm sorry, Brianna was my pushback person. Brianna would argue about everything just because she thought that she was smarter than everyone else. And I've told her this so many times. You don't have to win every battle. Sometimes you're better off just letting alone. But she always had to have the last word, even if she was wrong. <clears throat> when her and Lori would discuss things, I would just sit there going, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> you know, not to my wife, but to my kid. Um, but I explained to my daughters how men think. Okay. Um, now, <laughs> And Brianna looked at me and goes, why am I responsible in how other guys think, how boys think? And uh, I said, I'm sorry. I, I wish that that was not true. But unfortunately, you have to think about that. And uh, I realize that most women do not dress to impress men. Okay. Do you know who women dress to impress? Themselves. Okay. <laughs> and if anything, other women. They don't really dress to impress men. Okay. Now, guys, we think they dress to impress us. They don't. Okay. They could give a rip of what we think of them. You know? But women, they, their self-image is based a lot on how they look. Um, I can get ready to go, out, go away in about 10 minutes. Um, most women take how long to get ready? <laughs> Is it more than 10 minutes? More than, more than 10 minutes, yeah. It's just, it's <laughs> Jen is sitting there going, I need 15, right? Um, <laughs> when, when I was on the farm, I used to be able to come in smelling like barn and in the car within 10 minutes. I mean, and I, I don't think I smell like barn yet. Take a shower, get changed, boom, 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 boom. Um, women take time, they look at themselves and they change clothes and they change clothes again and they change clothes again and then again and finally end up with the first one they put on anyways, but that's just me getting myself in trouble. Um, your flesh doesn't care about your eternity because it's not going with you. And I had this up last week. I think there's so much truth in that. Uh, the flesh is the one thing that doesn't go away at salvation. Okay. Now, your old man's dead, and because you have the new man, you have the ability to control this guy. But um, this bugger will come back to haunt you more and over again. Paul's going to talk today about braided or, or braiden and plaited hair and it's like who cares but it was an issue in, in the Corinthian church and we're going to understand hopefully we're done why it was an issue and this is it says his braided hair or braided hair or plating of hair sinful and I've never heard of some of these things and if you just read that passage in 1 Corinthians 10 out of context and not knowing what's going on, the conclusion you're going to come to is, number one, women should always be wearing hats. And number two, they have to keep their hair not braided. And, and the answer is, why? And we're going to see why more than anything else. If any of you have ever done this to your hair? Um, most of us have not. Um, do you know how long that takes? Yeah, Hours. And I'd be like, why? <laughs> okay. Um, now, some people say that that's what broided or plated hair is and stuff. Now, I did find out that once you do that, you know how long they keep that in there for? A long time. Okay. And I think, can you wash your hair when you do that? 
You wash your skin. Yeah, I think there's certain things. Um, um, some of us white people can't do that. <laughs> yeah. um, it's more of a, some other races and stuff. But I, I think that's kind of cute. But I would never do that much work to, to do that. I, I, I'd just be like, wow, that's a lot of work. Um, but some of that is, you know, the issue that Paul is going to be talking about here. Unfortunately, some of the women who had accepted the gospel also began to dress in the elaborate manner, drawing the attention unto themselves. And what we're going to see now is what the underlying issue was more than anything else. This has nothing to do with hair. It had to do with what it meant and just understanding personality or the flesh more than anything else. The issue couldn't pass under the carpet without the apostle addressing it in a clear-cut manner. Thus we find Paul and Peter providing necessary counsel to the women in this practice who profess godliness. Okay, So th that is going to be the issue is... We profess godliness, and is the way we dress affecting how others perceive our godliness? And I know now we're thinking about others again. Who cares about others? If we try to please others, or we're never going to be happy. And I understand that. But we have to have some boundaries in the sense of we have to be willing to give a little. Okay? In 1 Timothy 2, now again, we're going to end up in 1 Corinthians, but this is good background. Paul says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, who knows what that even means? What does it mean by modest apparel? What was considered modest in the 1950s versus modest now. Has that changed? Yes. Yeah. For the better or worse? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, see? Okay. And with, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided or braided hair, okay, or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, if that becomes an absolute, ladies, what, what can you do with your hair? And, and you can't wear gold or pearls? Let me check out. Am I wearing pearls or gold here? You know. Well, what, what is Paul talking about? Okay. And the issue becomes more than just that this is bad. The issue is becomes extremism and what it represents, okay? But which becometh women professing godliness, all right? So th this is the goal with good works, okay? So we, we, when this is more important than this is, is when we run ourselves into problems. Or basically, moderation is still the answer more than anything else. Now, 1 Peter 3, and then I'll explain some of this. Likewise, the wise be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the, out the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. So again, now we have that same issue of your hair and, and gold. And we're going to call that accessorizing more than anything else. Is that a problem? Now, Paul doesn't tell the men what to wear. You guys notice that? Okay. Um, so now we get to 1 Corinthians 11. Now, here's the issue. And I think there's a slide coming up that's going to explain a little bit more of that. The, the, the problem in the Corinthian church was the well-to-do women tend to dress more extravagant than people who didn't have a lot of money. So they were basically showing off their status in society. Plus, there was a group of women that tended to dress a little bit over the line with their hair and gold. Do you guys know what group of women that was? Prostitutes, okay? Temple, temple prostitutes. Now, was temple prostitution a problem in Corinth? Yeah, big time, okay? Was that a distraction? Yeah. Well, some girl comes walking in who, who maybe doesn't even know it or maybe doesn't know it or maybe just likes the way those girls dress. I don't know. What is going to be the thinking of some of the weaker brethren? Oh, she is probably a prostitute or she thinks she wants to be one. I, I don't, you know, why, you know the, it, it becomes complicated. So Paul's like, don't even go there. So 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is going to follow through on some of these same thoughts in regards to even wearing of hats and things, okay? Be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Now, I love 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Um, that verse is so good because the question then comes, well, how did Paul follow Christ? Paul did not follow Christ in doctrine. Do you know that? Because if Paul would have followed Christ in doctrine, he would have been under the law. Because Christ followed the law, obeyed it perfectly, and Paul said, no, the law is not for us. So 
Paul's not talking about the law here when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. He's saying how Paul followed Christ in character, okay? The way he lived in regards to his interaction with others. That's the key he's talking about. But now Paul moves on. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. Now, ordinances are what? You may know. When you break an ordinance, what's that? It's kind of like a law, right? I mean, so, well, Paul, I, I thought Paul didn't have the law. Now he's talking about keeping ordinances. Paul spends a lot of time telling us what to do. You guys know that? I call them suggestions. Okay? It's common suggestions or good living comments. And sometimes we as Christians need a little bit of a push to live right. And that's one of the things that Paul's doing here, especially the Corinthians, because they love to take grace and just take it to the end. I can do that. And Paul's like, why would you want to, though? And that's really what he's going there. Why, why would you want to do these things? Okay? Um, <clears throat> how did Paul follow Christ? Well, in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all expectation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now, again, the issue here is Paul's a sinner. In fact, he says he's the chief sinner. It means he was the um, worst of the worst. That, that's where Paul puts himself. He says, I, if you want an example of a sinner, make me the poster child, is what he's saying. How be it for this cause? What's the cause? Christ came into the world to save sinners. For this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. All right, here's the pattern. The pattern is that we should have long suffering just as Jesus Christ had long suffering. Now, did Christ do things for the sake of what was right, even though he didn't have to all the time? I mean, Christ let people you know, pluck his beard out. Um, Christ let people crucify him. Why? Because he knew the big picture. And he didn't have to do that, but he did it for love and for the long-suffering of others. So that becomes our pattern. In Galatians 5, Paul says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Again, as grace believers, there is no law. We can do what we want. You know, you can wear whatever you want, and you're not going to lose your salvation. That's not the issue. No one's going to stone you for it, okay? Only use that liberty for the occasion to the what? Here we are again. There's the flesh. Tastes good, feels good, looks good. Again, even mature Christians are going to struggle with the flesh until they die, and especially the issue of pride, okay? But by love, here's a word, serve one another. If you're serving somebody, are you like bragging to them? No. You're helping them. You're coming down to their level, I guess you could say. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Treat others like you would treat yourself. R really, the grace life is not that difficult. You just keep the, the main things the main things. And that's what Paul's doing here. But then in verse 15, he says, but, okay, in other words, if you don't want to do that, let's look at the other way. If you bite and devour one another. Now, are, are some Christians, are there some Christians out there that really we should be biting, in a sense, <laughs> or putting in their place, and telling them why they're wrong, and, and pointing things out to them? All, all the time. But the problem is, just like this, these young ladies, if this guy would have went up to him and said, young ladies, I can't believe you were in front of the people dressed like that. I cannot believe that at all. Don't ever do that again. They would have got offended because obviously, I'm not sure who the weaker brother was here. Um, sometimes that just doesn't go over well. Okay, If you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one or another. You're going you're gonna to destroy each other. There, there's never a good winner when it comes to that kind of stuff. This I say then, walk in the spirit, here's the answer, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the, the, the answer, the problem is the flesh, and the answer is con controlling the flesh. Really, if we can control the flesh, we can control our lives. That's the key stumbling block within our lives after we're saved. In Galatians 5, Paul tells us how mature Christians should act. And we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we now need to reap that fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Th that's the characteristics that we are looking for as Christians when it comes to not only our lives, but also as we interact with others. 
And sometimes, like I say, sometimes it means just letting it go, not even worrying about it, because most, most issues hopefully will take care of themselves, but by us pushing it, it's kind of like, a, what happens when you, when you um, pop a pimple too early? It usually gets infected or doesn't even get healed, right? You gotta wait until the timing's right. I used to drive me crazy when you know, my mom would go, oh, it's not ready yet, and I'm like, just pop it, you know? Because <laughs> it hurts, okay? And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. Affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Again, the flesh loves. Look at me, look at me, look at me, provoking one another and envying one another. Again, can it get any simpler than that? I, I don't think it can. It's just keeping the main thing the main thing and putting others first and kind of getting over ourselves. And society is more and more about I have rights. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, I can do what I want to do. Who cares what you think? Well, as Christians, I don't think that's true. I think we need to worry about others and things like that. All right, now we get to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, these kind of verses usually get women mad because on that chain were women. Number three, right? First we have Christ, and then we have man, and then we have women. The thing of it is, if, if the man is doing what he's supposed to do, he's going to treat the woman right, and this is not like, you're, you're my slave, you must submit, let me tell you what to do. Um, does it work to have two people who are, are in charge? Well, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And hopefully everybody's on the same page. There's no need for that. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now, now Paul's going to get into stuff here which has more to do with society, what was considered normal, than anything else. What Paul is saying there is that if you're involved in praying or prophesying, you shouldn't be wearing a hat, okay? Okay? Because that dishonors his head. <laughs> it's like, what is he even talking about? And again, it has more to do with who's in charge than anything else, okay? But every woman that prayeth or prophesying with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all, all one as if she were shaven. Now, the issue here is they're praying and they're prophesying. So I'm assuming that Paul is talking about they're leading a service or they're involved in some sort of leadership position. But the point he's making is there that they have to have their head covered um, and they can't have their hair shaved off. Okay, now, okay, why is that? What, what's the deal there, okay? For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Like, okay. Now, anybody you know any bald women on purpose? <laughs> um, I don't think that's ever going to become a style. Do you guys think so? Now, my, young, or my oldest son, he, um, he doesn't shave his head. He clips it really tight about every week. And the reason he does that is because he has a receding hairline. And he doesn't want to have to do that little comb over thing, you know, to where you take one side of your hair and you dump it over. That, that's not popular anymore either. Um, but I do not recommend a woman making her hair that short. And, and his head, he says his head doesn't have too many bumps on it, so we either didn't drop him a lot or he's got a good head. Some people don't look good bald, okay? But I don't really think, you ever run any bald women in your line of work? Yeah? Chemo. Chemo? Yeah. Usually they're wearing a wig though, right? Can some, can some women do bald? Yeah. yeah? Okay. You think it'll ever become a style? No. <laughs> Once they can grow their hair back again, they usually do. Okay, they usually do. It's just not common. Now, I'm sure there's more guys who purposely are bald than women that are purposely bald. But, but this whole issue about honoring God and dishonoring God, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and why Paul's even worried about that. But it was a problem within the church in regards to what was going on. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now again, this is an issue where Paul's saying, guys, you know, let, let's not, this unisex thing we got going out there now doesn't work, okay? God did not create whatevers, okay? Um, when you were born, your parents put on the birth certificate that you were what? Male or female, okay? 
Now there's more choices I get. Or to be determined later. Well, how can you determine this later? Or we're going to wait till the kid decides what he wants to be. No. Well, men cannot get pregnant. Only women can get pregnant. That's just the way it works. And you're either a male or a female. That's the way God designed it. God said the man's in charge. The women are, are not. But they all have their purpose. And if a guy's doing what he's supposed to do and he, he listens to God, the woman will want to listen to the man. But unfortunately, men are not doing a good job of being in charge. Okay. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now, this this will really get women mad. <laughs> now, again, remember back in the Garden of Eden, God created Eve to what? Help Adam. And, and if you've got a, a good teamwork going, it works out real well, you know. If your guys are wired differently than, than women are, you know that? Um, would it, is it a good idea? I'm going to give myself. I am not a big fan of having the President of the United States be a, a woman, that this is me. Now, do I think women are incapable of being president? No. But women are wired differently. They're, they're emotionally different than men. But now together, it work makes a good team. But that's some of the reasoning that Paul's putting here, too, is the fact that the idea is to come together and work as a team rather than have one or the other in charge. But I just think it just works out better if we obey the way God designed it, okay? For this cause ought the women to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, this one gets like, what about the angels? <laughs> now, what are angels doing today in dispensation of grace? Does anybody know? Yeah, yeah. If any of you say that they're guard, guard, guardian angeling me or protecting me from you know doing anything stupid, they're not. And, and Janet has it right. They're watching. Okay. The dispensation of grace is not an angel-based dispensation. Now the kingdom is where they were going back and forth, and and I think what they were doing was doing God's work in manipulating things on the earth. Whereas grace, God is not manipulating things on the earth. And so angels are watching. What are they watching? They're watching grace. This is something they never heard of before. They're watching God's grace. And so Paul even says, hey, even the angels are watching. Don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> That's really what he's kind of saying. Let's make this a good example of how grace works. Women's hair was a common object of lust and iniquity. Okay. Now, now we're pulling the curtain back and seeing what the problem is, okay? Now, guess who is having the lust problems? <laughs> the men, okay? To fail to cover their hair was thought to provoke male lust. Okay, now. Now, I read an article that said, you know how the Muslims cover everything except their eyes, women? That, that even guys say that, some, that that can be enough to sexually turn them on, you know? <laughs> okay, fine, you know. Um, Guys are weird. I'm sorry. You know, provoke male lust. Head coverings prevailed in Jewish Palestine and elsewhere, but upper class women, eager to show off their fashionable hairstyles, did not practice it. Okay? So now we're seeing how the flesh and styles and things like that come into play. Okay? Thus Paul had to address a clash in the church between, here's the issue, between upper class fashion and lower class concern or fashion also. Is that ever a problem within churches uh, to where it, that takes place? And the answer must be, well, yeah, obviously it did in the Corinthian church. Um, of all the things that have ever been an issue in the church, uh, that's a difficult one to address. You know, it, it's like, quit dressing so fashionable. <laughs> you know? Can't you dress down a little bit? And again, some people put more emphasis in that. Mother, from a guy's perspective... I, I could wear the same suit every week, and I would assume you would never notice. But he's like, yes, I would. <laughs> I, 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 fashion doesn't, and, and you're like, I can tell, Dave. You know, I've never been into that. But some people are really into that, and that's why Paul had to deal with it. It is beyond doubt that the apostle took a positive stance in favoring of head covering. He gave at least four reasons for his conclusion. First, the headship of God, of Christ, and of man. Secondly, he presents God's purpose of creation of man and women. And thirdly, he speaks of the angels who observe our worship and are concerned about God's order of administration in the church. So it's there. And, and the thing about it is it must have been a problem within the church that Paul is actually spending time writing this in his letter. Because remember, Paul's addressing problems that they ask him about. He's addressing problems that he heard about. 
and he's addressing problems that he wants to address with them. So, but the letter is pretty much fixing all these problems within the church, which had to do with their liberty in Christ more than anything else, and how to get through life as a Christian. Remember, the archangel who rebelled against God's headship was Satan. Lastly, Paul reminds us of nature. This verse implies that for a woman to have head covering in addition to her long hair is to say amen to divine ordination. So we, we can see how these things work out in regards to how things are there. All right, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man and the Lord. So again, let's, let's work together here. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, it is comely that a woman praying unto God uncovered. Does not even nature itself teach you that it is, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, people have asked me, especially guys, can I have long hair? Okay. And usually to be a smart aleck, I say as long as it's not longer than your wife's. <laughs> I personally think guys don't look good in long hair, okay? Anybody, any of you guys have a ponytail? Jay, you got a ponytail? <laughs> no. That's just my opinion. Now again, it, it, the thing about nature is, Danny, you know about this, in the, in the bird, the, the bird environment or nature, which is prettier, the male or the female? Normally, Normally the male. Now, why is the male more cuter? What, what's he trying to do? Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's trying to attract a mate or attract a female you know so the issue of long hair in the sense as far as men and women go i i like long hair and women but i would never want to have long hair because you know how much time it takes to take care of long hair and all you women are like yeah you know it is an issue um my girls all had long hair as long as i could keep them in long hair and then they finally they had short hair because it's easier to take care of um but the issue here, more than anything else, is it, it's all relative. Um, I, I don't like it when women have such short hair that you know they look like guys. But if their hair is a little long, I don't care. You know, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. I am not going to die on these hills. But obviously, they had a problem within the Corinthian church that Paul had to address it in regards to just common sense more than anything else. And I think the biggest thing is others. If, if you're dressing a way that it's going to affect how others can worship in church or what others think of Christianity, I, I think we need to reevaluate that more than anything else. What you want to do in private, I, I don't care. I, I really don't care at all, okay? Even he then who have no special revelation shall have a natural inclination to distinguishing of the sexes by the length of their hair, okay? Um, women generally having fuller or longer hair, human beings instinctively distinguish between the sexes in different ways, one of which is the length of the hair. And, and that's just reality. When, you know, it's just longer hair seems to be something that females have. Shorter hair seems to be something that, that males have more than anything else. Um, plus, on the farm, you know, you don't realize how many smells get in your hair. And if you have long hair, I just think you smell more <laughs> more than anything else, okay? First Corinthians eleven fifteen. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if a man seemly to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And what Paul is saying there is that pretty much this is common sense. All the churches agree. Um, just let it alone. Um, but Paul addressed it there. His issue is hair. His issue is head covering. His issue is braided hair. Uh, just be aware of how others will be affected by this as far as things go on. All right, that's that issue. Now we're going to get to another issue, which is the Lord's Supper within the Corinthian church. Um, now it is, said, it is said that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. So, so now Paul's changing gears here, and he's going to talk about another issue in the church is when they get together and practice the Lord's Supper, or basically practice the Passover meal. Because that, that's a little bit more what the Lord's Supper is in this church than anything else. Remember, the Corinthian church was full of Jewish people who still were under the law. And under the law, you practice these feast days, and one of the feast days was Passover. And what you did on Passover is you had the Passover meal. And it reminded you of what happened in Egypt when the, the, um, the Israelites were preparing to leave Egypt and go into the Promised Land and the meal that they had, and that they did every single year. 
For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partially believe it, or partly believe it. The, the Corinthian church was full of cliques. And so the church would get together, and they would have their, their Passover meal, which if any of you ever had it, it's a very bland meal, and uh, it's, just, it's interesting. Um, and they had that meal, and some of them had a lot, and some of them had a little, and they kind of did their own thing. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Where you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now the answer is, well, yeah, it was. But what they were doing was they were abusing it in regards to what was going on. For in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper, and one is hungry, another drunken. So everybody was having their own little private, you know, one family had the their meal here, another one had there, one there and there. Now remember, this was a church that had different classes of people. And so some people probably had a lot, and some people had a little. And they weren't just having what, what you know, would be like a, a supper where everybody just brings all their stuff and throws it in a big pile. They were kind of having little private suppers all around the church, okay? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Now you think about that as like, why, why did he even do that? You know, well, why would you even think that it's okay to have different cliques in the church having these meals and not doing things together as a group? I, I don't know. Um, now I'm not a big potluck fan, but I don't know why that wasn't a potluck. <laughs> okay, rather than have everybody do their thing. So this is more than just the bread and and the the um, the juice. This is the whole meal and some people had a feast and some people had nothing and Paul's like hey you know one's hungry and another one's drunk they turned into a big party and some people had a lot some people had nothing well, go home and eat this is not the purpose of this meal then Paul says in verse 23 and this is a verse I think a lot of people do not understand for I have received the Lord that which I also delivered unto you now what Paul's going to talk about is the part of the Lord's Supper that Paul was not aware of. You're like, well, what part wasn't he aware of? Okay. Paul knew all about the, the Passover meal. But at the end of the Passover meal, what did Christ do? He took the cup, he took the bread, and he ushered in what was called the New Covenant. Okay. Now, the Passover, in a sense, was the Old Covenant. Paul didn't know about the New Covenant because he wasn't there. Okay. Paul wasn't part of the Twelve. He wasn't at the, the, the Passover meal that Christ was at with his disciples. So God had to tell him, okay? Because even the Jews as a whole, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they weren't there either, okay? So even though Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and he was part of the, the higher council within Jerusalem, as far as the leadership goes, this, this Passover meal that Christ had, that they did, but at the end where Christ took the cup and he took the bread, that was not part of their tradition either. So Paul had to learn this too, that the new covenant was coming. For I received the Lord that which also I delivered, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. All right, now. By New Testament, he doesn't mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? The word is covenant. Okay? And Testament and covenant are the same thing. What Paul is saying is, or what Christ is saying, this is the new covenant. Now, who knows what was wrong with the old covenant? Anybody know? What was wrong with the old covenant? It, it didn't work. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't live up to it because it demanded what? Perfection. No, it was like, well, so how is it going to work in the New Covenant? Well, God's going to change their stony heart and make it into a fleshly heart, and they're going to be able to live the law. Okay? That, that's the key. But first they had to fix the Old Covenant. And who fixed it? Christ did. He did it by living it. Okay? So what, what Christ is saying is, 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 I'm going to usher in a New Covenant, one that's actually going to work. Um, he said, so it's a New Testament, a New Covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, I have no problem with grace people, grace believers, practicing the Lord's Supper. 
It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. But we've got to understand, there's more to it than just remembering Christ's death, His burial, and resurrection. It, it's the new covenant. It's, it's the New Testament. It, it's the ushering in of this, this covenant. And this covenant does not start until Christ returns to set His kingdom up. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with grace believers? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. But Christ's death, His burial, and resurrection have a lot to do with grace believers. Because that's what gives us salvation. But it also is what gives the the kingdom saints, the ability to have a new covenant. So there's a lot more going on at the cross than we realize. But I do not believe that Paul was explicitly talking to grace believers and telling us that we should be practicing the Lord's Supper. Now, again, if, if you want to remember Christ's death, burial, resurrection by doing that, I have no problem with that. But I do not believe it's part of a salvation process where you have to do it every week, or every month, or every quarter. But it is a very humbling service that helps us remember it's about Jesus. Amen. And that I like. That I like a lot. So, but so, so again, grace believers, there's, not, there's no ordinances we have to do to either get saved or stay saved. But when it comes to the, the Passover meal, it changes everything for the Jews. And the church was full of Jewish people. And the grace people could, could follow along too. And maybe some of the problem within the church was the, that the, the Gentiles weren't practicing the Passover meal, and so they didn't bring a whole lot, and, and the Jewish people were. I don't know. But it was such a mess, Paul had to deal with it more than anything else. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthy, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, this is a negative, okay? You know, where Danny was talking in Sunday school about if you don't forgive others, Christ isn't going to forgive you. Um, this is not a good grace verse that's coming up here, okay? Um, but it's sure a good kingdom verse. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So if you don't have the right attitude, if you don't understand what's going on, if you're not living right, you're not taking the Lord's Supper properly, and you're in trouble. What's the problem? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. What did it do that? <laughs> oh, my battery's getting low. Okay, that's nice. I know, that's because I didn't bring my... For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, Jan, you work in a hospital. Um, do you think Paul's talking about dozing off here? <laughs> no. He's talking about you're dead. So the judgment, if you're not doing the Lord's Supper right, is God's going to... Um, might have to kill you. Now, is that good grace doctrine? No. Really good kingdom doctrine, though. So again, we got a church that's in transition, um, but don't think for a moment that God is doing that today, but I'll guarantee you, during that time, He was doing that to the Jews, which I think were the main problem within the Corinthian church when it came to that supper. For if we would judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. But we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Paul's goal was always get your act together, live right. And again, what the law is after, grace is after too. It's righteous living. Now, the kingdom program, the law does it with a stick. Okay, You start seeing people dying, it'll shape you up real quick. You know that? <laughs> oh man. You know, um, you know, so and so wasn't living right, and now he's dead. Maybe I should live right so I don't get dead too. And and it, it, the law did that. That's what the stick did. Uh, grace doesn't have that stick, but we should still live the same way because of what Christ did for us. Amen. What did Christ do for us? He died on the cross for our sins, and we should have an attitude of gratitude. Now, do a lot of grace people abuse that that grace all the time? So grace should humble us enough to want to, to do even what the kingdom programs did. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. For if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye may come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. So again, put others first. Treat others like you treat yourself. There really isn't a whole lot more that would make your life easier. I mean, but people get selfish. The flesh gets selfish. Uh, the, the flesh loves to be prideful, and that's what gets us in trouble. We, we need to humble ourselves, and a lot of these problems won't even come into play, really, more than anything else. But sometimes we, you know, we want to be right, and that's not good. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we, we think of these things, and we, Lord, we wonder why 
even why they were a problem. They shouldn't have been. Uh, these are petty, just childish things. But yet, Lord, sometimes we do act childish. And we need to be reminded that it's time to grow up and put others first. And sometimes putting others first means that we have to just let it alone. Lord, we pray that we can just see the big picture and, and put Christ first and, and put others first. And then all these things will fall into place. And we ask for wisdom and guidance. And Lord, we just, just ask for just being a good witness to the world out there. And we pray this in your name. Amen.